Okay. There we go. I should be on. Let's see. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, yeah. Um, why? Why 45 years? Um, many years ago, I was a volunteer teacher down in Mississippi, and I watched the movie Jeremiah Johnson, and I was just captivated by the story. Any of you have seen the movie? Yeah. Okay, so I go to the library the very next day and try to find Jeremiah Johnson. I couldn't find Jeremiah Johnson. I should have been looking for. I don't think you're on. You don't think I'm on? Okay. That's on. Do I need to be closer? No? This worked two hours ago. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me there? Yeah, yeah. he's mm -hmm. oh, Okay. All right. All right. Good. I'm sorry for the interruption. That's all right. So I, but I found uh, Liver Eating Johnston, uh, who some of you know uh, is uh, in this region as well, or was in this region. Um, and then I, I started to look at the biographies and what's been written about Bridger, and I was amazed at what he had done. And then I was further amazed at how many people, including myself, didn't really know much about him. And uh, so I thought I would just write a book, and I thought it would take a couple of years. Uh, well, then I got engaged with a, a museum on the Mississippi River, and uh, that was so exciting that I kept doing that all day long and then tried to do this at night. Took a lot of travel uh, trips. I went to the National Archives dozens of times. I went to um, repositories and archives across the country uh, to research Bridger, and I'm really glad I did because I was able to find a lot more information. How many of you have read one of the biographies about Jim Bridger? Okay, the last one was 1962, and it, it was actually a rewrite of a 1925 uh, book. Uh, so there's lots of information here. Of course, you all, you all have heard about Jim Bridger and know, know something about him. Uh, I learned so much about him, though, I'm, I'm surprised. Even, even within weeks of submitting this to Oklahoma Press, uh, new information was coming in. And uh, they, said, they said, well, you know, the time for review is done. I said, you have to let me put this in. And uh, so they said, we're going to give you 48 hours. We're going to send it. You turn it around right away. And uh, so I was able to do that. Jim Bridger led an amazing life. And it, it started very, very early. Uh, the theme of this book, the unwritten theme, is in search of home. Um, and that's what Jim Bridger was trying to do. When he, he was born in 1804, he died in 1881. So he had a 77-year lifespan. And most of it, almost all of it, he's been out on the frontier. Uh, his mother died when he was 12. His brother died when he was 12. His father died when he was 13. So that left us Jim and his sister. So Bridger at first got a job working on a flatboat. Uh, he was living in a place called the American Bottom, which was the American side of the Mississippi River country. Basically, it's right now uh, Cahokia and East St. Louis, that region there. Um, and that's probably where the ferry boat was going, although in my research I found out there were 17, I think, different licenses to, for people who run ferry boats. I couldn't find out which one it was that he was, that he was actually working on. Uh, <coughs> then he, he apprenticed as a blacksmith. The, all the biographers before this one had said that he apprenticed to a St. Louis blacksmith. Well. That's very diminished in terms of what he really did. He apprenticed to one of the world's greatest gunsmiths, a man named Philip Creamer. So Bridger was learning how to be a blacksmith to aid this gunsmith, who was extraordinarily talented. He made uh, rifles. Uh, you know, Harper's Ferry made a lot of the rifles for the, world, the uh, uh, War of 1812. But uh, uh, Creamer, with probably Bridger's help, made some of that. By the time he was uh, 12 and 13, so something he's orphaned, he's doing this as a, uh, an apprentice. But during that War of 1812, Bridger and his uh, family, they were terrified that they were going to be attacked by a group of Native peoples called the uh, Potawatomis. And in fact, the governor of Illinois Territory sent all of his children back to Kentucky so they could be safe. People like uh, the Bridgers and others who were living in the American Bottom, uh, the uh, volunteers built blockhouses at every 10 miles. So if the raid was happening uh, by the Potawatomis or the Kickapoo or the Shawnee, they would have to run to one of these blockhouses and defend themselves, hold up until other volunteers could, could save them. 
the unusual thing is when the war is over, the US won the war, the Potawatomis uh, then entered into an agreement where they were going to get uh, some supplies and some help. And Jim Bridger actually lived among the Potawatomis, the same people he was terrified. Uh, still, he's only 13 years old. And I want you to get a flavor of, of the, the, the narrative of, of how, the, how the book is written. So while Bridger was helping shape iron, his life among the Potawatomis was undoubtedly shaping him. He had seen his family and neighbors live in fear of the Potawatomis and other Indians throughout the war. Now, living among them and interacting with them and their families, Bridger was introduced to a peaceful coexistence with the Indians that he would come to embrace. And he did. He became very, uh, very much friends to the Shoshone and the Crow and the Ute and the Flathead and the Nez Perce um, and uh, Lakota at times. Uh, initially not the Blackfeet, but eventually later in his life the Blackfeet as well and many others. Uh, he, could, he could speak a smattering of at least seven Indian languages. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what he did, the things he did that are significant nationally. But I'm also going to be talking about what kind of personality he had, or what kind of skills he had, or what kind of person he was. Because to me, he's a wonderful person to meet and to learn about. And I've met him by going to all these research centers and finding out and learning what other people have written about them and, and putting that in here also. And uh, every time I read about Bridger, I learned something new. So I was talking about languages. Uh, there's a time when he was about in his 40s and he was guiding Howard Stansberry and he was taking them from, um, from the Fort Bridger area over to Fort Laramie. Along the way they stopped to, to meet with some Lakota and Bridger could not speak the Lakota language but he was an expert at sign language. And so the, the, the scientists, we have now topographical engineers, map makers who were sent out by the government to, to map all of this a few years after Fremont and we have uh, Smithsonian scientists who are gathering specimens. And then we have a number of soldiers who are on there to, to protect the whole group. Bridger starts talking to these Lakota in sign. And they record that he talked for a half hour <laughs> this way. And I can't do any of it. Um, and at times, people were on the edge of the stone they were sitting on. And at other times, these Lakota were laughing. And other times they were they were like amazed, or it was a very dramatic moment, and they they just couldn't imagine how a person with just their sign uh, could talk for a half hour and bring them through all those emotions. Uh, but that's the kind of man he was. He would uh, he loved the land. He was he was illiterate. He could not read and he could not write. But if someone asked him for advice on where to go. He would start drawing in the sand right away, and he'd say, well, you got these mountains here, you got to take this pass here, be careful, there's a poison uh, a water hole over here, don't let your horses drink from that. He knew it tremendously. At his house, someone would say, you know, is there a better way from Fort Bridger to Salt Lake? He said, I know a way, and he goes over, he gets a stick from the fireplace, it's charred, and he starts drawing right on his door, and he said, now, you go here, you go here, now, here's the Wasatch Mountains, you're gonna go through this way, and you're gonna go down then this way, and then he said, but you're, you're with the wagon, aren't you? He said, yeah. He said, well, then I would not recommend it. What I told you there was on horseback. So you'll have to stay with this, this route particularly. So he was very careful about what he told people. He always told the truth. Um, but he loved to talk about that. And he loved also to talk about all the things he'd seen and done. Um, so when Bridger was 17, he wondered what would he do with his life. And uh, this is a, a scene of, of uh, Trappers, they usually trapped in groups of two, um, and so they, they would set the trap, and then they, they would put out the, that stick there, it's going to keep the trap in place. In 1822, this ad appeared in the uh, St. Louis newspapers. Bridger couldn't read it, but what I write in this, I can, I But almost every boatman and trapper in St. Louis was talking about what the ad said. William Ashley and Andrew Henry were looking for 100 enterprising young men to follow the Missouri and to stay there for one, two, or three years. So Bridger was wondering, what is he going to do? If he did look up the Mississippi River, he might have wondered, where is the source of that river? It hadn't really been fully discovered yet. If he looked down the Mississippi, he might think, 
well, that's New Orleans, and I've heard of that, and that's where the, where the Battle of New Orleans was. Uh, in fact, he, he later said that uh, old, uh, old Hickory gave him the fork and a sort, sort of uh, damn lightning that any Britisher had ever seen. Uh, that, that's the language that, that Bridger used, at least according to Marcy. So Bridger's thinking about this. So are a lot of people in, in the St. Louis area. And some of these trappers, this is from the text, some trappers saw themselves building their fortunes on beaver pelts. Wives and sisters saw their men disappearing to a land of Indians and grizzlies, perhaps never to return. Did Bridger sign up for an adventure to escape the expectations of civilization? Was it to make his fortune? Or was it to take the measure of the new land and make it his new home? And that's exactly what happened. So he goes, he signs on at 17, he goes up the Missouri River when he was 18. He's on a keel boat that's commanded by Mike Fink. Considered to be a legendary figure, no, he's an actual real figure uh, who was actually killed uh, very near the place where Fort Union was built uh, later. And that's where he actually uh, uh, lived for a while there and was, was basically murdered by another one of the trappers and killed them. Um, so when, when Bridger was 20 years old now, he went up his kill boat and they ran into a lot of difficulty with the Blackfeet. They went overland um, and now they're on the Bear River. Um, and if you know the Bear River, it starts to flow north and then it turns and starts to flow west and then it turns and starts to flow south. And all the trappers then, and, and Bridger's in a group led by John Henry Weaver and, uh, and uh, Daniel Potts is there. He's keeping some records of it, uh, writing letters about it. They, they're starting to place bets, and you know how trappers can be. Uh, they're, they're arguing with each other, then they're putting money up there, they're betting each other. Uh, Bridger either volunteered or he was told that he's going to be the one following the Bear River, find out where it goes. He goes to the Bear Canyon, and he comes to this enormous lake, which had been seen by many others, but no Euro-American had ever not notified or found out that it was made of salt. This was Great Salt Lake. So Bridger, at age 20, discovered mm -hmm. Great Salt Lake. They go to the rendezvous, and this rendezvous system starts in 1825, and for 15 years, or 16 years, they had the rendezvous up to 1840. Uh, William Ashley and Andrew Henry, who's now dropped out of the, out of the organization, he has $50,000 worth of trade goods. Uh, I'm gonna get to a point where I can, uh, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit. Um, this is called Preparing for the Buffalo Hunt. This is also by Alfred Jacob Miller, painted in 1837. This is what I wanted to show you. So the, uh, the Bear, well, here's the Great Salt Lake, and the Bear River starts here. Goes up, over, down. Um, so then they have the first run, go right about here, and then can you see the Bighorn River there? Um, and so they wanted to take that through the Bighorns, Bridger, at age 21, is the very first person known in history to go through the lower canyon of the Bighorn. There's a place called Bad Pass. Anybody ever heard of Bad Pass? It's on the, the uh, upper or the lower canyon, in other words, northernmost, but the, but the lower in terms of uh, the flow. Uh, and the Crow Indians told a, a French-Canadian voyager in 1805, there is an evil spirit of Manitou who will destroy you in any raft or boat that you're with, that you're, um, so, but in 1825, at the age of 21, Bridger becomes the first person in the world known to go through that, the rapids of Bad Pass on the Bighorn River. Uh, in 1822, he's in the first, or, excuse me, when he's age 22, in 1825, he's among the first group of uh, people who go through Yellowstone, and I mean the actual, today's boundaries. Uh, we do know that uh, they were just, just were, uh, explored earlier by John Coulter in 1807. But so he's doing this all as a very young man. Uh, the Bannock Indians stole horses from their tribe. Uh, Bridger and a man named Tom Fitzpatrick went to get them. He's now also only 21. Uh, so Fitzpatrick is firing onto the, the village to try and distract them. Bridger leading men who are probably 25 and 35, maybe even 45, he's, he's 21. He's leading that group to go where the, the horses are, right next to the village, and they, they steal their horses back. Uh, so he's a man of extraordinary, um, uh, shall, shall we say, uh, initiative. 
he, he jumps to what he might be able to do. Making a bull boat, for example, this is not, he's not in this particular scene, but this is also a painting from 1837. Um, but there are times where he made and told people how to make bull boats. Uh, for example, when he was guiding along the Yellowstone River, and he was guiding Ferdinand Hayden, who was for the Smithsonian, and he had just discovered a year earlier, two years earlier, the first dinosaur fossils in North America. So Bridger was now guiding this man and a man named G.K. Warren, who was mapping the entire western area here. They were, they were the Yellowstone River and the Big Horn, uh, and they were going further uh, up the Missouri. So Bridger was guiding them on the Yellowstone. They had an enormous amount of, of specimens they wanted to take back to the, to the Smithsonian. So Bridger told them how they could build a bull boat. Basically, you know, they don't have saws, they don't have uh, planks of wood, they don't have nails, but they have buffalo hides and they have willows and they have sapling that, and they can, they can tie it together. And uh, he actually told them how to make a bull boat that was about 20 feet long, up still only maybe four or five feet wide, but 20 feet long. And he did that many, many times. So he was a, he was a boatman as well as, a, a, you know, started as a trapper and an explorer. He soon became a, a leader of many of these trappers. Uh, this is a, a, a painting called uh, Hunting Elk. And he was an excellent hunter uh, in terms of elk. When he was with William Reynolds, who was uh, exploring this vast territory of Montana, Wyoming, North and South Dakota, uh, um, Reynolds said, there's an elk over there. And Bridger said, I'm going to go shoot him. I'm going to get him. I'll hunt him. Uh, in, even though the night before, uh, Indians had broken into their fort and, and to try and steal horses. But he just went by himself with his rifle and he dropped the elk. And I don't know whether any of you have, have hunted elk, but I've heard this is large. Um, he said, you better, um, you better just get a cart and bring at least four men because he, 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 he uh, was successful at hunting them. And so without the head and without the legs, and uh, they were able to bring back over a thousand pounds of just the body of this, of this one elk. It's also said that in 20 consecutive shots, he could shoot 20 buffalo. And not the way Buffalo Bill Cody did with a, you know, a, a very fancy rifle on a tripod from a distance. This is riding through a stampede of buffalo. And I'm sure he probably also got lost. And a lot of these trappers got lost. What was it like for these, these people living out here at this time in the 1820s? Washington Irving, uh, a famous American artist, wrote about them, and he said this, and he's talking about Bonneville, his primary subject, but he's also talking about Bridger and Fitzpatrick and Jedediah Smith and others. A totally different class has now sprung up, the mountaineers, the traders and trappers that scale the vast mountain chains and move from place to place on horseback. They are heedless of hardship, daring of danger, prodigal of the present and thoughtless of the future. There is, perhaps, no class of men on the face of the earth who lead a life of more continued exertion, peril, and excitement. So it must have been a really exciting life for these people living out in the West, even if you are going to get lost someday and wonder, are you going to make it back to the, to the, uh, the home brigade? There were very few, well, there were no white women here for these white men uh, to engage with. Uh, so uh, many times, and this, per this person here, the man in blue, is visiting in a Shoshone lodge, uh, and so there's a, an elder, there's a woman with a, a baby, there's another man and woman, uh, they're smoking, uh, he's talking sign language, um, they may end up uh, a marriage out of this at some point. Uh, Jim Bridger married uh, when he was in 1834, he was 30 years old, and he married a flathead woman. Uh, also known as Salish, Salish. Um, and uh, she and he had three children. And then it's said that she was bit by a rabid wolf and then went and got hydrophobia and was uh, sick with that rabies and actually wandered off and never, never came back. Uh, he then married a youth woman named Chipetta and they, she had one child with him uh, and that was 1848. All the historians have said it's 1849, but I've corrected it to 48. The problem with Virginia Bridger, she lived on to 19, 1920s. 
but in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, every year when she uh, talked to the census, she kind of lowered her age by one year. <laughs> um, but it's, it's pretty obvious that she was born in 1848, or she was, uh, yeah, she was born in 1848. So she's the daughter. The mother, Geppetta, died two weeks after that, uh, probably from uh, complications due to the pregnancy. And then his third wife was a woman named Mary. Uh, she was a Shoshone woman, uh, much younger than Bridger. Bridger was 46 in 1850 uh, when the census taker came around. Uh, and they, uh, and uh, she was 20 years old, at least according to the census taker. But that was fairly common uh, to have a, a, a young Indian bride. So this was a great um, confluence of cultures here. Uh, you've got, in, in the brigade of men that Jim Bridger is leading, uh, there are people from Virginia and Kentucky, he's from Virginia, there's from Kentucky, New York, but there's also people from Mexico, there's people from Canada, French Canadians, there's people from Ireland, uh, people from Germany, uh, there's a man named Henry Frapp, uh, which is how he said his name, but it's spelled F-R-A-E-B, he was a partner of Bridger's, and was actually, uh, Frapp and Bridger was a partnership, and that's where the, they built the first Fort Bridger, and it was built on the Green River uh, near the Sandy, um, and that was 1841. But then the Lakota attacked, and mainly the Lakota were trying to attack the Shoshone, but Frapp was there with them, and they were hunting, and they were what they call making meat. They were hunting buffalo and then drying it, uh, preparing for the winter. Uh, and Frapp was killed at that point. And so Bridger th uh, thought three things. One. I need a new partner, and he went back to St. Louis and got a new partner, Louis Vasquez. Two, this is not a very safe place to have a fort, so I'm going to move my fort further west, which he did to its current location. And three, this is not a safe place for my daughter, and she's six years old now. It's about time that, that she starts getting education. So he sends his daughter Marianne up to the Whitman village or Whitman missionary. Um, and she was actually, um, she died as a result of the attack, what's called the Whitman Massacre in 1847. Um, so, and by the way, the, the second fort bridge was built on a bench up high looking down over the current fort, at, and that was 1842. The third one was built in 1843, very close to where the facsimile of that fort is. Uh, I was just there for the Fort Bridge of Rendezvous, the first time I've been for the Rendezvous. It's an amazing spectacle. Uh, usually about five or 6,000 people a day come to it. It's alarmingly uh, amazing. Anyway, um, so Bridger was a great storyteller, and one of his favorite topics was Yellowstone. Bridger saw Yellowstone when he was 22 years old. He saw those thermal wonders, um, and he told people about what he saw in Yellowstone. As people started recording this, I mean, uh, so uh, Howard Stansberry, uh, John Gunnison, um, Explorer Reynolds, uh, G.K. Warren, the map maker, Ferdinand Hayden, they're all write this, his descriptions down, but nobody really takes it any further. Um, there's a Kansas City newspaper writer in 1857. He writes the story about Yellowstone. He was, that was gonna be the first kind of like um, popular history or or first to the general public as opposed to people who are either in Congress or reading these long reports. But he went to talk to some of his, his uh, friends and they said, you'll be laughed out of the town. People will say that's just old Jim Bridger's lies. Uh, so he never published it in 1856, 57. When the uh, Yellowstone became a national park, the first national park in the world, he actually printed a public apology to Bridger and told this whole story about how he didn't believe Bridger. He thought Bridger was just making it up for, for fun. Um, and, uh, and so he publicly apologized, which by that time Bridger has, was reclining in his later years. Um, it was 1971-72. Um, and so Bridger had been away from the mountains for about four years by then, and his eyesight was going bad. Uh, but many people think that perhaps he was the uh, godfather of Yellowstone in terms of keeping that message alive. And I relate that to this because this is tall tale time. This is a, 
you know, you've been out all day, you've been trapping beaver, maybe you had a, a fight, uh, you know, with a, an attack or someone stole your horses. This is now time to gather around, and there's several messes like this. This is a group of 100 men who are under Bridger's command. But one of them, undoubtedly, is going to stand up and start telling a story. And then another one will tell a story. And Bridger will tell a story, but he'll embellish it because, you know, when you're talking to scientists, you tell them the truth. When you're talking to your buddies, well, you know, the fish gets bigger and bigger, doesn't it? Uh, so that's part of Bridger's life, too. This is a person called uh, Eagle Ribs. And uh, he and his men gave Bridger his most uh, severe um, injuries uh, in his life. The time is 1833. Bridger is up on the Madison River, and uh, there's, he's leading a group of you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 men and some Indian women traveling with them. The Blackfeet uh, are on the other side, and so they're coming together to see if they can work peacefully together, if they can trade, or at least get out of each other's way. Um, and Bridger was very good at what they call treating with Indians. In other words, uh, discussing coming out with, uh, without warfare. Uh, but there was an altercation, and so Bridger was meeting this, uh, uh, this man, Eagle Ribs. And now this is a painting at the Smithsonian Institution. It's done by, um, by Catlin, George Catlin. <coughs> and when Catlin interviewed him, he, uh, he didn't get the right uh, uh, group of Blackfeet Indians, but he was a, uh, we know that he was, a, he was part of the Blood Indians. And Eagle Ribs told Catlin that he has, he's wearing eight scouts of white men that he personally had taken. That's 1832. So this is about uh, 14 months later. Bridger encounters this man. He's already uh, killed um, uh, Vanderberg, uh, who was a part of the American Fur Company, one of the other uh, arrival uh, trapping area. So, so Bridger arrives, uh, and he's got his, uh, he cocks his gun when he hears some commotion. Eagle Ribs, when he hears that, he immediately grabs the barrel of Bridger's rifle. And Bridger is startled at it, and so then Eagle Ribs pulls the barrel down, which makes the rifle go off, uh, which then makes Eagle Ribs, you know, take the rifle totally out of Bridger's hands and hits him over the head and the back of the neck. And many years later, uh, in letters to Casper Collins, that Casper Wyoming is named after, Bridger told Casper, uh, who was young at the time, 20, 21, uh, he said, he said, that, the hardest time was I was hit by that rifle and it hit me so hard I thought I was going to die. Um, so what, what happened is uh, then through all this melee, Bridger got two arrows in the back. And there was a lot of warfare back and forth and when they finally, both sides retreated, uh, then they, they came to Bridger who was laying there with two arrows in his back. They pulled one out right away. The other one, it didn't come out until Marcus Whitman came to the 1835 rendezvous three years later, and he pulled that other one out. Now, Marcus Whitman was a, was a doctor and a surgeon. Um, I know I've looked at his records, and for example, he paid $2 for his anatomy class. He paid $4 for some other classes. That's what it was like uh, in that time period to be a doctor, and then you would actually ride with another doctor uh, and you know, learn, I guess that's what's called residency now. Um, so, so this is the man who, who was a missionary, but he also took the arrow out. And, and brand new, a lot of the information I've been sharing is new. The, the, the name of Eagle Ribs and all of that is new. Um, but there's another description of taking this out of his back. And they've been roaming around for um, um, almost three years. So we have a, a new, a new uh, witness. The doctor cut deep into the sores and around the arrow point with a sharp knife, and he inserted some instrument like a pair of pincers. The point had struck a bone and had partly clinched around a rib, and it required the strength of two men to pull it out, meaning to pull the arrowhead. You know, Bridger was laying down prone on the ground. Bridger had to be held down. He bore the operation with only a slight groan or two, and the point actually straightened out when it gave way. And Bridger gave a groan. <coughs> he's a remarkable man, and he's, at this time he was known as the King of the Mountain Men. This is Fort Laramie, and it was built by William Sublette. 
Uh, these were usually family affairs. Uh, Sublet had four brothers. All five of them went out and, and traded and trapped in the Rocky Mountain region. But William was the oldest, and he built this fort in 1834. Here's what it looked like three years later in 1837. And here's a view of the inside of this fort. And uh, above the entrance, there was a, a cannon that they would have. It would be probably used mostly to frighten uh, Indians, but it, certainly if there was a whole group of Indians, they could. It wasn't a howitzer, for example, which would you know, have a much broader reach. This is the 1837 rendezvous. I've talked about these rendezvous, and this is how all these people got supplied. Um, it used to be when Bridger went up for one, two, or three years, the idea was that after two or three years, you come back to St. Louis and spend the winter in St. Louis, and then you go back again. They decided, no, we're going we're gonna to have everybody, all the trappers, stay out here all winter, all summer, all spring, all fall. And so they did for four, five, six, ten years. Bridger stayed for 37 consecutive years before he visited St. Louis for about a month and went, came back. Basically, he didn't really come home again or go back to the settlements again until 1868, from 1822 to 1868. He lived more on horse uh, than, than he did in a house, and uh, he slept more on the ground than he did in a bed all that time. So there's a man who arrives at this 1837 rendezvous. He's now come from, to all these rendezvous from 33, or uh, starting in 33, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And this is taking place uh, near Pinedale, Wyoming. So it's where Horse Creek runs into Green River. And I'll just read to you what the artist says about it. <coughs> it's pretty interesting. Oh, well, see, the, the, uh, the armor, he's wearing some armor here. This is a helmet with a curat with a plume, and this is a cuirass, which is a breast, breastplate and a backplate. And so the artist, Alfred Jacob Miller, who most of the paintings have been showing you, and this also, the whole plain is dotted with lodges and tents with groups of Indians surrounding them. This is all a peaceful trading fair here. To the left rises a bluff overlooking the plain. In the midst of them is Captain Bridger in a suit of armor. This gentleman was a famous mountain man, and we venture to say no one has traveled here within for the last 30 years without seeing or hearing about him. Now this is a close up of that same image, that's why it's kind of blurry, uh, but there's Bridger you really can't see what he looks like. In 1837, he is 33 years old, about the age of most of us in the room here. <laughs> there was a man who was at that rendezvous in 1837. His name is David Brown. And uh, he was a trapper under Bridger. But eight years later, this was published. He published it in the Cincinnati Atlas newspaper of 1845. So Captain William Drummond Stewart comes from Scotland. He has this gift. For Bridger because he looks at Bridger as King Arthur and these are these are the Knights of the Round Table, these courageous people that Washington Irving also described. So uh, a little over the top in his description Irving was, but and some of this will be too. So on the right of Captain Stewart sat, or rather squatted, and I, he said that because Bridger hardly ever sat in a chair. He would sit on a rock, he'd sit on a fence post, he'd sit on the ground sat, or rather squatted in oriental fashion, one of the most remarkable men of this remarkable assemblage. This was Jim Bridger, the leader of the beaver hunting parties. He had a complete and absolute understanding of the Indian character based on his own large experience. To sum up, his bravery, bravery was unquestionable, his horsemanship equally so, and as to his skill with a rifle, he had been known to kill 20 buffaloes by the same number of consecutive shots. Here's what he looked like. The physical confirmation of this man was in admirable keeping with his character. Tall, six feet at least, muscular, without an ounce of superfluous flesh. His cheekbones were high, his nose hooked or aquiline. The expression of his eye, mild and thoughtful, and that of his face, grave almost to solemnity. So that's a little bit of what Jim Bridger looked like when he was 33 years old. This is one of his friends, Thomas Fitzpatrick. Uh, Fitzpatrick came from Ireland, and I had the good fortune of working with several uh, people from the American Mountain Men and others, and we took a contingent of actors over to Scotland and Ireland and Northern Ireland. And we were in the village of Thomas Fitzpatrick. We were in the, the home, actually, of Robert Campbell, who's pictured here. 
Um, and we also then went to Mirthly Castle, the castle where uh, this um, William Drummond Stewart uh, lived. And by the way, William Drummond Stewart, 20 years after, after that arrowhead came out of British back, uh, William Drummond Stewart is writing a semi-autobiographical novel. It's really about him, but he has another character. It's called Edward Warren. It's not the best novel you'll ever read. But anyway, he, he put footnotes to his own novel. And he said, and I was there, and I saw this arrowhead being pulled out of Bridger's back. And as I write this book now, meaning the 1850s, I have that very arrowhead in my pocket in my castle here at Murphy Castle in Scotland. So they're, they're extraordinarily good friends, as, as was Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick put together this uh, great Indian treaty of 1851. It was supposed to be at Fort Laramie, but there are so many Indians and horses that, are, that came that they, they overgrazed, and so they had to go down to Horse Creek. Not the Horse Creek on Green River, but the Horse Creek near the Laramie River. And Bridger came uninvited. Uh, the, the purpose of this was, this is now the Oregon Trail uh, and the California Gold Rush particularly. There's so much uh, warfare and stealing of horses and, and taking of Indian land. This is going to be the great big treaty that would solve all the issues between Native peoples and Euro-Americans. Well, Bridges said, well, I'm coming with the Shoshoneans. And I, Shoshones. And they said, no, but they're not Plains Indians. And they said, yeah, but we're still running into the same problems and we needed help. So Bridger actually was delegated by Fitzpatrick to draw the big map where all these 10 nations, what would their new boundaries be? Uh, so Bridger and, and Fitzpatrick all, outlined all that. Father DeSmet actually did the official map and that was used uh, to create that, that broad landscape, you know, which is probably six or eight states now. Uh, as I said, he could neither read nor write, but he was extremely intelligent. Fitzpatrick is going to Washington, D.C. because he wants to have another treaty in 1853. Bridger's going to Washington, D.C. in 1853. Isn't that unusual? Does anybody have an idea why Bridger would be going to Washington, D.C. in 1853? Well, in, 1840, in 1843, Bridger built Fort Bridger in territory belonging to New Mexico. In 1847, Brigham Young comes out with over 100 of people and then comes thousands and they built their settlements also in Mexico. 1848, the Mexican War is over, now that's part of the United States. Uh, so 1853, Bridger is uh, charged uh, with selling alcohol and or guns to the Ute Indians. The charge is a charge of treason against the United States of America which would mean most likely death, life imprisonment. They're not going to be, well, just don't do it again. Uh, so a posse of 80 come to take Fort Bridger. And uh, they want the Green River Fairies, <coughs> and they want Fort Bridger itself. Bridger was making a lot of money there, selling horses and trading to immigrants coming by. So Bridger had to actually uh, escape from this fort, find a tall tree. Uh, someone said it was actually in an eagle's nest. And he had a uh, telescope, and he was actually keeping an eye on what's happening. Uh, there's no way that he could take that fort back, uh, except by going to Congress. So this man who could not read nor write was going to go talk to senators and congressmen. And he does in 1853. So Fitzpatrick and Bridger, they leave on Christmas morning and uh, leave from St. Louis, probably by wagon, maybe by train. Uh, two months later, Fitzpatrick dies in a hotel called Brown's Hotel. I, I saw in the Washington Star newspaper of 1853, I saw Tom Fitzpatrick and Jim Bridger, they, they put up announcements of who checked into various hotels. So checking into the Brown's Hotel was Fitzpatrick and Bridger. Um, Bridger was there to try and get his land back. And so they were negotiating the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the, the bills, the, the boundaries, and they were going to take the land away from the, from the, the uh, Utah Territory and uh, make it part of Nebraska. Now this will be a little bit of a coarse language and it's a uh, course by Brigham Young. Brigham Young is writing, uh, when he hears that Congress is actually starting to redraw the boundaries of Utah Territory, Brigham Young writes to his friend John Bernheisel in DC. He said, if 
members of Congress think that their Jim Bridger is the oracle of all things West, tell them, kiss my ass, damn you. <laughs> and then those five, last five words are crossed out, but the document is still there. But then he goes on to say, uh, but you can, you can tell members of Congress that if Bridger were to come back and act the same way that he's acted before, he will be strung up between the heavens and the earth. So Bridger was forced to sell. There's no way with that kind of language and threats <coughs> that he could go back and, and retake Fort Bridger. Um, so he sold out for a total of $9,000. Um, 7500 plus is the value of the livestock, the horses and the oxen and the mules, as well as the inventory that he had. The, the fort itself was worth $1,450 or something like that, a very small amount. And that was the fort that Bridger was probably grossing $10,000 a year, not netting, but at least having that kind of gross income. Uh, so Bridger did agree to the agreement because he had no choice, but he still felt for the rest of his life that his home had been taken from him. And that's why I said at the beginning that this is a search for home. Parents died, brothers died. Uh, he goes out west, he's living, and three wives of his die. His fort's taken away from him, he, he can't. And in fact, uh, members of Congress, they actually wrote to uh, Jefferson Davis, who was still on the side of the Union at the time of 1853. Uh, he, they asked him, and he said something to the president, and the president said, no, it's not our jurisdiction. And so the US just said, we're just not gonna get into this, it's a territorial thing. You have to go deal with Brigham Young and the and the federal judges that are in Utah. But anyway, so that, that's a significant moment in Bridger's life. And it's about that time that he turned from, you know, his first life was a, a trapper and explorer. His second one was as a, a fort keeper on the Oregon Trail. And his third one now became guide and scout. And he was one of the most prominent in all of American Western history. And these three elements of his life, a lot of people only know one. They know on the Oregon Trail like Fort Bridger, or they know the fur trapping era uh, from the American mountain men. Uh, those who know about the Plains Indian Wars know that he was instrumental in trying to bring peace. Uh, he and Kit Carson were good friends. Um, if there's time in the question period, I'll show a time where they disagree with each other. This is an image of Fort Bridger painted by William Henry Jackson. Excuse me. And this is one of his friends, Washakie. He was one of the great leaders of the Shoshone people. Uh, this is the area, and I'm not going to go through it at, at depth, but at the top left, you see all the different uh, expeditions that he was the chief guide for. Uh, Stansbury, where they, in 1850, where they actually brought to light what was the Bridger Trail, which is down farther, um, about the middle there, right next to Fort Halleck, uh, well, this high and to the middle or right. But also that, that, that became the Overland Trail, which then became the route of the railroad and then became the route of Interstate 80, more or less. Um, another significant one, I mentioned Warren, uh, that's when he built the bull boat. Uh, the next one, he was the chief guide for Alexander and Johnston in the Utah War. President Buchanan said, I've had enough of this with Brigham Young. He's going to step down as, as a leader of the, uh, he's still the leader of the Mormon Church, for sure but he's no longer going to be governor. A man named Albert Cummings is going to be governor. And so Bridger was the chief guide to bring the soldiers there. Um, and then he guided uh, the uh, uh, Raynons, which I spoke about, Bertha Pass, but also a whole route from Provo all the way to Denver, which was never realized in Collins in 62. Um, and so it was a very significant period in American topography. And Bridger was the man. Uh, this is a hand-drawn map. Bridger first drew it in the dirt, and then Collins actually did it with pen. You can see it's on lined paper. It's been torn out of a book. This is the hanging of the chiefs. Uh, and I'll just say this is one of the, the uh, most aggravating or insulting thing that, that uh, General Connor, Patrick B. O'Connor, and Colonel Moonlight could do. They said, not only are you going to hang them, but you're going to leave their bodies hanging there. You're going to put weights on their ankles so when their bodies deteriorate, the limbs will fall down, and it'll be a total humiliation of these uh, Lakotas. 
and that, that led to uh, warfare in 1864, or 65, 66. Bridger developed the Bridger Trail, which is the dotted line, and it's on the west side of the Bighorns. Uh, the east side, there's several different versions of the Bozeman Trail. And I, do, I have to correct, I put it on my Facebook post, but near, Brid, near Bridger, uh, the town of Bridger, um, last week, there's a sign that said a woefully inadequate trail. And it ended up by saying the, the 1864 Bridger Trail had only an estimated 450 people. Uh, well, or 450, uh, yeah, 450 people. By my research and by the research of James Lowy and others, there was 2,500 people that took the Bridger Trail, the Dodden Trail. Only 1,500 took the Bozeman Trail. The Bridger Trail was, was drier, but it was by far the safe one because it went through Crow country. And the Crow said, where's our friend Bridger? We want him and his people to come through our land. Uh, when they went to, uh, when the Bozeman people went on the, the uh, Bozeman Trail, they met uh, Red Cloud. And, they, and Red Cloud said, you may not go across our land. It's from the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho. And he said, you go the Blanket Chief Road. And, and the Blanket Road, that was based on Bridger's Crow name. Bridger's Crow name was Blanket Chief. Uh, his Lakota name was Big Throat because he had a severe case of goiter and his neck was very big and they called him Big Throat. It was because he was drinking water uh, straight out of streams and didn't have much salt uh, and other things, so he had thyroid issues. And this is an image uh, which I found uh, that, that's at the Smithsonian marked as Kit Carson. Uh, it's not Carson at all, it's Jim Bridger. And it's actually an image that then someone painted, William Henry Jackson painted. If you look closely, you'll see the ribbing, and I don't know if they called it corduroy then, but it looks like corduroy now, um, the term I would use. Uh, so that's from an 1850s photograph that's just been colored over by charcoal in 1874. So that's a, a very rapid sketch of a person who's extremely significant in American history, a person who had tremendous conflicts, tremendous friendships, um, and a person who uh, at one time in, in American history was considered one of the leading frontiersmen of all time. So when they were going to build Mount Rushmore, the characters to be envisioned were Lewis and Clark and Sakakawea, Coulter, Jim Bridger, John C. Fremont, and Buffalo Bill Cody. That was to be Mount Rushmore. Then Borgum, the, the, the sculptor, said, no, no, I think I wanna, I wanna do it over here instead, and I want four presidents, and, and they did. And I'm not complaining about it, but I'm pointing out how important Bridger was to the nation, and how significant he was in the American memory. Uh, and that's why it's been a pleasure for me to write this book and research this book and to talk to you about it uh, because I think this is a story that just continues to need to be told and told. If you are interested, we do have copies of the book. They're available for $29.95. So are there any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, did he have anything to do with the Hugh Glass bear story? I'm about 50-50 on that. Yeah. Um, first of all, the, the Hugh Glass was mauled by a bear. Henry said, we, we, he can't move, but we need to do something. You know, somebody has to stay with him. A young lad, 17, Bridger was 19 at the time, a 17-year-old said he would stay with him. And Henry said, this man isn't experienced enough to stay with him. Well, by 19, uh, Bridger was much more, by 1824, he'd been out in the mountains for two years. Uh, so he was much more experienced than, than that. Um, because it actually happened in 1823. So I take that back. He'd been out there for one year, one and a half. But that, that boy was somewhat of a hero, saying, I'll, I'll go, and not for any money. The next guy, Fitzgerald, said, I'll go only if you pay me $40. And so they both went, they both stayed. Um, the rest of them left. They abandoned Glass. Fitzgerald said, no, it, uh, he died, and Bridger did not counter that lie, if it was Bridger. But the, um, this actual this painting here that I saw in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and a, a photograph of it. In those same in that same file, there is uh, the first the first and only I think statement from Jim Bridger himself. 
Uh, this is from a man named James Stevenson who, who he said, I hunted and tented with Bridger. Uh, Bridger was hunting for meat for the camp. I was hunting for specimens to be put in the Smithsonian. Um, and then, so he's answering a whole bunch of questions in 1886 from a professor at Madison. And the question was, did Jim Bridger desert Hugh Glass? And the answer was very succinct. Bridger told me about your Hugh Glass, and he did not desert. The actual words were, there was no desertion, but everyone knows there was a desertion, but he was not guilty of that. So that's why I say it's a 50-50, whether he did or not. But he was there. He was among the group of 100 trappers who were there. Yeah. And this is supposedly a photo or a, a, a rendition that's been recolorized. Right, exactly of right. Of Bridger? Of Bridger, yeah. Do you see a hooked nose there? Uh, no, I don't. And I'm not sure I see one here either. Well, maybe you see a little bit. It's a thin nose here. It looks like a thicker nose. Well, no, it's kind of thin there, too. So this is in 1860s. This is in 1850s. And of course, the, the, uh, the Aquilin nose was a, a writer from 1837 and it was published in, uh, eight years later. So, But, but you, can you see a similarity between those two? The uh, Smithsonian, when I called the Smithsonian and told them that, that it's at the Smithsonian, they said, well, we have that image, but we have it labeled as Kit Carson. And I said, well, it's not Kit Carson. Yeah. <laughs> so the forced, forced sale at D.C., did that actually occur at D.C.? No, the forced sale uh, was occurred at Fort Bridger. It, it, it occurred there. So he never, he had to return from D.C.? He had to return, and, and they might have said, had some kind of a truce, or, you know, we're not going to arrest you. They, you know, none of that documentation is there. But he actually went went there um, in August of 1855. And the sale was to the government. No, the, well, no, the sale was. I, I see what you're getting at. The sale was to a man named Robinson, not Robinson, but Robinson, B-I-S-O-N, um, with church money. So the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints bought it for eight thousand dollars, and Bridger Vasquez received the money. Uh, and then they said that wasn't enough, so the Mormons added another thousand dollars. Then in 1857, when the army comes out and Bridger is their chief guide, he shows them, you can camp here at Fort Bridger. And the Mormons had burned, they, they rebuilt Fort Bridger. The Mormons burned that in 1857. And so the US Army said, well, we can't rent it from you. you don't, we don't have any idea that you own it. And so they wrote a, a lease that said, uh, we will pay you uh, $600 a year for 10 years provided you provide a, a deed of title. And Bridger never did. His family complained in, the, in 1882, I think it was, uh, Congress authorized $6,000, uh, not admitting that it was or wasn't, but just said in, in recognition of Bridger's contributions and to put to rest this. Uh, now, was that the same two forts, the one overlooked the old fort? The third fort was down on the river and the other one was up on the bluff? Or have I got the wrong well, place? the very first one was on the Green River. The second one was at, at the town of Fort Bridger, but up on the, the ridge. And and those cabins only lasted a year or two. The third one is the one that Bridger occupied 1843 to 1853, had to leave, came back in 1855, and got $4,000, 1858. And Bridger's was the first on the site? All those were Bridger's. Mm -hmm. All of them were. But yeah, the Fort Bridger, Fort Bridger, Fort Bridger. Oh, three Bridgers. Three Fort Bridgers, yeah. Yeah, yeah but only, only one was lasting. Mm -hmm. Good questions. But two of them were Bridgers. The other third one was after that he'd been forced to sell. No. He built, well, okay, so he built Fort Bridger in 1841 that lasted for two months. In 1842, he built one on a, on a ridge at the current town of Fort Bridger and only lasted probably one winter. In 1843 or late 42, he built his Fort Bridger, that was also Fort Bridger. Um, in 1857, 55, he sold it to the Mormons. In 1857, the Mormons burned that third Fort Bridger um, and then they had to leave shortly after. Bridger leased the land to them. Um, well, he's a fort building kind of a guy. Yeah, and he built any more anywhere else? <laughs> <laughs> well, he built a lot. He built a lot of cabins over the winter. That's what he, they would just yeah. do a, a, a lodge just for the land for the, for the yeah. winter. Wherever he landed for the winter. Yeah. Hmm. 
other thoughts or questions or comments? Well, the, the one story where the, he was trying to be uh, notarized for being in Yellowstone, Coulter it went through and it was depicted back east as being Coulter's hell. Right. 20 years before Bridger was even on the ground running. Right, yeah. So, so Bridger never said that he was the first to see it. Uh, Coulter was the first Euro-American that we have written documentation that they saw it. But for example, in 1805, uh, someone sends to Thomas Jefferson a drawing on, a, on a, uh, an Indian pelt, I mean a pelt, an Indian sends uh, an Indian drawing on, a, on a, a skin, and it shows a volcano where, where Yellowstone is. So Bridger never said that, but Bridger kept saying, I've been to a place where there's geysers, I've been to a place where there's, uh, he's talking about the, the black uh, substance that he called it, the Obsidian. mountain glass. Um, Obsidian, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, so he never said he, he, never said he found it or, or anything else. He just told, it, uh, told people about it, and they said, you're a liar, you know, or that's a good tale, Jim, but I know it's not true. But that was going to be in a major publication yeah, in 1856, and that was the editor of the newspaper right. saying, here are Jim Bridger's... And then he did a retraction personally to Bridger for <coughs> hesitating and not printing that? Yeah, he did. He did. And Bridger was living in, in, in Kansas City at the time, and this is the editor of the Kansas City newspaper. Pretty amazing. And that, newspaper. Was, that, that retraction was a public... Public, yeah. It, it published in the paper. Published, like, published in the Kansas City paper. He was yeah. still the editor. He was the editor yeah. in the 1850s. That was pretty amazing. It is amazing. Bridger was a, you know, I like to say that anytime somebody writes about Bridger, they're, they're amazed at what they learned, even if they never really ever met him. <laughs> so there are, people, there are people who say, I met Jim Bridger here, I met Jim Bridger there, and a lot of that is just story. They want to say, I met Kit Carson. There's a, Weiler says that he met Jim Bridger in 1862 in Utah. We don't know if that's true or not. Um, in Utah, he was, I think it was other places too, but he could have been there. He was guiding to, uh, Collins uh, or Bertha um, at that time period. So a lot of people say they knew Jim Bridger, they met Jim Bridger. Mm -hmm. It was a mark of great distinction. So I got one more for you. The yep. projectile that was taken out of Bridger's back that was supposedly in someone's pocket in Scotland, was it? Yep. Does that still exist or, or? No, it doesn't. But when we went to Scotland, we one of the turrets, he, uh, the, the laird now, Thomas Fotheringham, he took us up and he said, you know, we've got all kinds of stuff here. And I said, well, show us, show us. So we go like three flights up and he shows us all these boxes and everything. And I said, so how long has this been here? He said, ah, generations and generations. And I said, is the, is the arrowhead there? And he said, no, no, that's, you know, we went through it all. It's later than that, but, you know, so no, it doesn't exist anymore. So there had been an attempt to try to find where that was at in yes. that guy's mind. Yes, he knew that there he was. He knew that, that his ancestor. Had, that it was now an <coughs> unknown where he was at. It was not right. at that castle anymore. No. Mm -hmm. No. Interesting. Well, I've enjoyed visiting with you. Thanks. Thank you.